For us, as Bob mentioned, we have our, our treating philosophy that's based on the healing continuum and also on the hierarchy. But my part of the day is to talk about the healing continuum. So getting into it, first and foremost, you want to make sure that you respect the process. It is a process, uh, and you can't really run biology. The, the thing with it is, early when I first started, I thought I was like, oh, I can help somebody heal faster. I'm like, dude, you don't help people heal faster. What we do is we create the right environment for them to heal. That process is going to happen on its own, and it's basically dependent on their makeup and, and many different factors that come into play. But that timeline, our job is really to create that best environment for them to go through that process as efficiently as possible. So, what are the phases of the human continuum? First phase is inflammatory phase. This is going to be a little overview. You probably guys went through this, but it's really important for us to really make sure that we're covering some of the phases. It's like focusing on, on the essentials at the beginning. We put this in a course that we, we teach uh, on our new hires at the beginning just to make sure that we review, we have this fresh line. But it's a core cool principle because it, it aligns, I don't know if you guys saw it at the beginning with the hierarchy, it aligns with how we think about treating patients. So we'll, we'll get into that later on. So first phase is inflammatory phase, day one to day three. Then you have the proliferation phase that overlaps with that and starts with day two and goes all the way up to like six weeks. Then we get into the maturation phase, which is the last phase, and that also overlaps with the proliferation phase, starting at week three, going as far out as two years. Uh, throwing out a bunch of stuff in here that's blocking up here. So, as I mentioned before, uh, there's different factors that affect how long things are going to heal. So, one of our favorite things that we like to share with, with our, our people is the healing times graph. So, as you can see, it's not just based on time, but also based on the type of tissue that's involved in the injury and also how severe they is. So, if you look at this example here, uh, the, the tendon rupture goes anywhere from five weeks all the way out to six months. If you look at the grade two muscle tear, that goes from three weeks all the way out to about three months. And then down here from the ligament graph, you go from two months all the way out to about two years. And this, again, piece of how long it will take for somebody to recover from these types of injuries. So we're not just looking at the passage of time as the, the thing we're looking at for that healing process to happen, but we want to make sure that we have a, a set of criteria that we use to determine if that person is progressing the problem. Because I don't know if I mentioned before, but we can't rush it, but we can definitely slow it down. And our patient can slow that down too, we, this is, which is why we want to make sure that we're educating them and what the process is and what they need to do all the way. So, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with this Ben Snyder Mackler. Uh, he's a PT and researcher. He wrote this uh, article back in 2012 in the, that mentioned current concepts of anterior fusion ligament for construction, a criterion based rehabilitation progression. And as he said, the concept of recovery is not based simply on the passage of time, but rather on, on the achievement of measurable objective costs. So we're going to make sure that we're keeping an eye on those milestones as our patients are progressing so that we can get them moving forward in the right direction. So we're going to talk about the inflammatory process and explain some of those milestones. So initially, when the injury happens, uh, the first thing that happens is basic constriction. So your blood vessels constrict to kind of prevent that initial kind of too much uh, blood flow in the area so you don't bleed out. Uh, we had a researcher, PhD, recently, Susan Creechen, uh, who was on for us, and she mentioned that the research showed that the best time to do cryotherapy or life is within the first 30 minutes after the injury. And when I saw this, when the research was the talk, I was like, it's perfect time. The blood vessels make you constrict, I help to constrict the vessel, both helping create the best environment. So soon after we get the basic violation, this is because that basic violation allows for all the, the healing uh, healing things to come into play. So immune cells get in, in your place. So your immune cells come into play because they go in and they start to eliminate uh, any dead cells that came from the injury. They also, if you're dealing with an open injury, they help to get rid of any kind of external uh, 
uh, infection. We've got a plate in there to help to develop that initial body plot to help slow down that bleeding you know, during the time of the process. So, what are some signs of inflammation? So, in our case scenario here, these are all stuff that we know. You're going to get increased heat, you're going to get redness, you're going to get pain, you're going to get flowing, and you're going to get loss of function in certain uh, aspects. These are all ways that your body is trying to warn you that something's going on, that inflammation is happening. One thing we need to keep in mind is that we're not trying to prevent the inflammatory process, we're, we're helping. It's necessary for that to happen so that we can start the healing uh, taking place. So we want to make sure that we encourage that and create the right environment so that happens as quickly and efficiently as it can. Uh, for the space, remember we said that those vessels dilate so everything can get into there and, and clean everything up. And that by the end of it, we start getting new vascularization or just when new blood vessels start to grow in, we'll get into that a little bit later. Our, our real main goal during this time is to protect. I call this under the inflammatory phase for my patients, I'm like, this is the protection phase. We're working on protecting. This stuff just got messed up. We need to protect. So, going back to something the the healing process, we think that we can affect or do something about is pain, swelling, and pain and swelling can cause atrophy and loss of strength and blood production. So early on in my career, when I learned this pain and bone basically in hip loss function, I turned that into a mantra that I said in my head every time I had a new patient come through. Thank you. That's the perfect part. That's my lovely wife that. <laughs> Thank you. My wife would help me struggle. <laughs> so this became a mantra. So every time I had a new patient that had a fresh injury, the post doc, or the, they just got hurt, and like pain as well, and kind of muscle function. So I got to make sure I take care of that before I can even start giving them trying to work out and move or do any activities because that that going to prevent me from getting those muscles to work, which is what we're trying to do. So that was my go-to mantra. So what are we focusing on in the inflammatory phase? Again, like I mentioned before, we want to set up the right environment, we want to control that swelling, we want to help the patient manage that pain as best as we can. Uh, if we need to, we can get them to rest and mobilize to, to protect this in the protection phase. We deal with a lower extremity patient. We might want to put them in non-weight bearings and maybe help them use some crutches or a cane just to kind of, again, protect, protect, protect. Uh, and after a couple of days, we start getting into an active range of motion because we kind of get in a little bit of protection. Those early systems come into play, we got the clock put into place. So we can start gently working with that, keeping in mind that we're keeping that pace. Pain early on is a sign that you're irritating the issue. So, some of those consideration back, I'm a blood trainer. So, when we had, we had some of our athletes come in pretty much the same day of the surgery, so they go see the doc, get surgery in the afternoon, they come see us. So you see stuff like that. So you have uh, full surgical, open wound, super red, fresh blood, fresh blood happening. After a couple of days, I should start to kind of dissipate and start turning into more like a serosanguinous, which is more like a pinky, clear liquid. And by day four, it should start getting clear on this one on the right. Uh, one of the things we want to do, we want to make sure we're educating our patients on that process as well. And we want to be uh, proficient that, recognizing what that stuff looks like. So if you're changing the, the dressing, again, initially it's going to be bloody, this is normal. So if they ask you, like, oh my God, am I bleeding out? You're, you're not bleeding out. That's part of the process. You just got surgery. That initial incision is just like getting a fresh cut, it's just a control cut. So we're restarting the process again. Uh, as I said, after a couple of days, you get the serious angle, it should be pink, and by day four or five, it should be clear. So, this is what you should be seeing when we're helping the patient change the pressing, or if you're doing it on your own, we know, hey, this is what they should be buying. What they shouldn't see is this last one. You don't want to see any yellow, anything happening in the glass, it looks red, because that's really one of the last bad sign. It's a sign of infection. This happens, then we've got to make sure we get in touch with the surgeon. We've got to make sure that we take care of this as soon as possible, because we don't want that to spread and kind of ruin the surgery. So 
Inflammation is basically like a flash line. So in other words, it's going to happen outside of the brain. It comes in, brings in all the stuff that the body tries to throw in to like help start the healing process. But in its wake, it leaves a hot mess. And that mess runs with that scar tissue. Which kind of gets into the proliferation phase. I was trying to get the delay without everything working. So once we get into the laundry phase, proliferation phase, that phase I mentioned before, starting day two, we'll go all the way out to about six weeks. This is when the fibroblasts start to come into play, start to synthesize the scar, start to lay down type 3 collagen. This collagen is laid down randomly. Just they come in to try to put stuff down to try to get the process of that raw material that they put down for us to get a help uh, start fixing things. One of the things around this time early on in the proliferation phase, this tissue is only about 50% of its strength. It's not like the tissue that was there before, it's brand new, like a joke around the patient saying, like, you have baby tissue. This tissue was just born. So we got to be careful with it. We don't make sure that we're gentle and moving. We want to protect that baby tissue. So that means that that major collagen that gets laid, laid down uh, is similar to like when, when you work with cement. So recently in front of my building, they were replacing the sidewalk and the truck came up and dumped on the cement. And imagine the workers never showed up and the cement just laid there. The next day, which would be this hard rock blob of useless thing that you can easily take at it and really wouldn't do much for getting out. So the workers came in, they worked at it, they raked it, they shaped it, they made it look like this fancy sidewalk on the right hand side, which is what makes it more silly. If you guys ever noticed on the sidewalk, there's these lines that go across, there's stretch lines that they put on it so that the sidewalk can resist like, either the movements in the soil or they won't crack. So, similar to how the workers come in and, and help to shape the sidewalk, our job as clinicians to help our patient convert that collagen and that baby tissue into some kind of normal facility. That's what we're doing. So what are we focusing on during this time? So inflammatory phase should be done by now. You're out three to seven days after the injury. Uh, swallowing, again, that's something that should be almost gone and probably on its way out. Yeah, and it's swallowing hidden muscle function. So we're that stuff out of there. Uh, the goal during this proliferation phase is a little bit longer, it's a few weeks is to start to uh, gently introduce stress, move on to make sure that you're also incorporating some cardiovascular fitness stuff in there. So if you're dealing with a lower extremity injury, upper extremity fight, that kind of increase in cardiovascular fitness helps with blood flow, which blood flow is good for that inflammatory phase and proliferation phase to kind of get the body going. And eventually you get into your muscle control and strength and we'll come to that later. So we talked about introducing stress. So if you've ever been bitten by a snake or when we see somebody get bitten by a snake, the, what's the anti venom What's the solution? Snake venom. So the same thing that can kill you can heal you. So the thing that makes it different and turns it into more of a remedy is the, the right amount, those right dose. So I've heard, Starting to apply some of that strength into our system, especially really doing a proliferation base, we want to make sure that we're putting that in at the right level. <clears throat> right. Uh, so, one thing you want to keep in mind as you're putting the right dosage, you want to make sure that you're only switching one of the, the Things at a time. So you don't want to increase intensity or volume or frequency. You don't want to do all of them at the same time because, again, if you get into trouble and you add too much stress and you change more than one thing at a time, you now have to figure out what did I change, what do I need to dial back on. So you want to make sure that you're systematic or you have a problem. <laughs> the reason you want to do this is if you add too much stress early on, you start getting into. <laughs> So the reason you want to do this is because if, if you end up putting too much stress too early, then you start instigating the inflammatory process again. And what that does is that then gets the process restarted, 
and the carbon left will come back in again, then you start getting more columns dropped in place. And you want it to happen because if that continues to happen, then you can get into something like carbon fibrosis or fibrosis where too much of that uh, collagen gets laid in place and that, that tissue becomes fibrotic. In this case, like you can see this guy's uh, knee, too much collagen got laid in there. You have a ton of scar tissue. You look at this x ray, you look at the MRI picture, all this dark areas here is scar tissue. So this guy is, needs to go back to the doctor. They're going to have to go in there, clean that out, and, and help him move. But we don't want to end up there. So we're going to make sure that we're managing the amount of stress that we're applying, and we're, we're being gradual and systematic about that process. So some of those risk that. Again, during the proliferation phase, we get some angiogenesis, which is some new blood, uh, blood vessel coming in. We're starting to draw that back in after the injury. Uh, if, if with the surgery or the wound, you start to get some contractions and start to fold in. Then you start to get some also some epithelialization where that, that skin starts to close up and start to get closer to being able to work with it. So at around day five to nine, you start getting a little bit of a halo ridge. You see this kind of outer edges showing signs that, that the process is continuing to move forward appropriately. What you don't want to see is something like this around the same time period. Five to nine days, it shouldn't look like this. If it looks like this, red or, or kind of ugly like that. Again, we're, we're referring back to the surgeon. This could potentially be uh, uh, infection. And if it's open like this, especially after surgery, that, that surgical site should be opening up and looking good. So refer back. If everything goes right, after a couple weeks or four to six weeks, your surgical site should be closed. And this is where you can start introducing a little bit of a gentle scar massage. Uh, one of the things that happens when you get an incision for a surgery. You cut straight through all the different layers, so when the body starts to peel that together, you start to get some adhesions in between the different uh, skin layers. So, scar massage helps to loosen that up and to uh, improve for that movement. Which then gets us finally into the maturation phase. The reason why this is no man's land, what happens is once you get to the maturation phase, you're basically out of the, the, the rack. And, yeah. You're at a point where your post op patient and your just regular standard injury patient start to look the same because now we're focusing on just getting stronger. And as we all know, building strength is six to eight weeks. That's you can't, again, you're not rushing this, that's part of the process. Uh, what happens when it's time is your patient can start to get bored because, like, hey, I'm doing exercise. Yes, I'm getting stronger, but like, I'm doing the same thing all the time. So the point becomes no man's They don't see the process. So what I do with like this kind of thing is, so this is one of my favorite graphs. I use it not just for explaining the human continuum, but also for explaining the process of like learning a new language or starting a new job or learning a new skill. And you'll see how that applies. So during the early phase, that inflammatory phase, things happen quickly. Remember, one to two days, that inflammatory process happens right away. People are like, all right, after that, I have pain, and my pain is a little less after a couple of days, quick. In a proliferation phase, take a couple of weeks. You still see a lot of movement. People start to gain motion. They're able to move. They start going from like losing that function to starting to get function back. That happens again fairly quickly. And as you get to the back end of the, the last couple of weeks, then you get into the maturation phase, which is now a slow moving process of building strength consistently over time. But think about this as like the, like I said, learning a new skill or starting a new job. Early on, everything's new. You're learning new stuff, you're learning new, new processes, you're learning new skills, you're learning so many new things right away. But then once you know enough to be dangerous, now what it takes to then become more of a master is to do the work. You gotta put them to work, you gotta show up every day, pay for like learning how to be a clinician, show up every day, put the work in. Uh, one of the things I also tell when it comes back to like treating patients and stuff, the reason patients can get bored in this thing is because they just need to put them, they gotta be strong. But one thing we can do as clinicians is to mix up the type of exercise that we do. We can easily kind of fall into the, the rhythm of like, hey, you just need to get stronger when the load or, or resistance is on. So we're gonna do that. But we can also change the essence. It's like 
millions of ways of, of mixing up the different types of exercises. There's no reason we can we just have to use the same exercise throughout the whole body. We can take this exercise out and replace it with this one after a couple of weeks and get them strong out. As long as you load them up appropriately, they're going to progress. They're going to feel the changes, especially if you want to keep the body guessing. But the cool thing is, once you get into the flow and kind of steady and, and monotonous process, you hit the tipping point. And when you hit that tipping point, that's where performance happens. So same for skill, same for a new job, same for the human process. So once you hit that tipping point, this is when you become super happy because you start seeing all these, the, basically the fruit of the long thing. But that is one of my favorite things. So to wrap it up, get into the maturation phase. But the goal we want to hit is we want to make sure that we're, we're uh, improving that tensile strength of the tissue. And by the end, we're done with our patients. We want to make sure we're at least getting 80% of their previous strength back into play. And now we're working on, on loosening up some of those adhesions. Ultimately, we want to make sure that we're taking that person from this kind of crazy disorganized early tissue that they have to more of this normal uh, type tissue going away. The Wolf's Law states soft tissue alone will respond to physical demands placed on them, causing them to remodel to the tensile lines of force. So our bodies are super resilient. They're going to adapt to any stress that you put on it. It's our job to make sure that we give them the appropriate stress so that they can recover appropriately. So as I mentioned before, our treatment philosophy is based on these two concepts, the healing continuum, which you see on the left, and then the hierarchy on the right. And up next, Rob, can you hear the band? It's going to go into the background. Thank you.